So, let's just consider then where we've got to and what the picture is in our world that Ezekiel 38 would lead us to expect. Think firstly of Western Europe, and uh, this is known by the initials of the EBS. Oh, the European Beast System. Sorry, I forgot that. But that's what, uh, that's what it is, scripturally speaking, okay? Or we know about, uh, well, a few years ago it was EMU, wasn't it? Uh, uh, which isn't a cuddly toy, it's Economic and Monetary Union. Um, and there have been various, we've got the EU and the EC and all the others. But scripturally defined, that's what it is, it's the European Beast System. Because last time, in actual fact, we looked at the connection there was between the Beast System in Daniel and how it was taken up in Revelation and developed. And our world today is the end result of all of that change, of how man has worked from the days of the Roman Empire onwards, that as the beast has changed, it's reflecting the development of Europe over that period. Now, I said before that our world then looks at Israel and it doesn't like what it sees. This is, a nation, this is a, an interpretative notice. It's, it's a law, in other words, coming out of Brussels from the European Commission. And in November last year, they talked about what they saw in the very place where Israel now exists, where, remember, Ezekiel 38 said had, they had to be. Since the Golan Heights and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, are not part of Israeli territory according to international law, Shouldn't be there, says the world. Product from Israel, when they're selling things, is considered to be incorrect and misleading. So if you want to sell some Israeli wine from an Israeli vineyard that is in the West Bank, in Judea or Samaria, as scripturally defined, well, you have to be defining it now as a product from the West Bank, brackets, Palestinian product, or product from Gaza, or product from Palestine. That's what you have to call it, says the EU. And EU businesses urge occupied territories labels for Israeli settlement products. That's what they want it to be called, EU businesses say, in March. We should say that it's from the occupied territories. So this is the issue. This is how the world sees where Israel now is, in the place where God said in Ezekiel 38 they needed to be. And it's really become a feature of our world that well, as it describes it here, each year Israeli apartheid week takes place and raising awareness about Israel's ongoing settler colonial project and apartheid policies over the Palestinian people. Whether there is any connection there to the apartheid of South Africa is another very interesting question to follow up and to really see what's actually happening in Israel today and what was actually happening under apartheid. It's an interesting study to do. And in actual fact... They have learned lessons from what happened in South Africa. But look, here's the point. The attitude to Israel and their use of that land has and is having effect in our world. So that France took a decision earlier this year not to buy drones made by Israel because of the power of that political movement. BDS stands for Boycott, Divest and Sanction, which is all about basically making Israel try to get out of that place, but saying they shouldn't be there. And now churches have taken it up, and they also, in the States, uh, as, as you see there, are beginning to run with that as well. And one of the founders of that way of thinking actually decreed, we are not there yet, but we are reaching our South Africa moment. So the purposes of the world then are to discredit the nation in that land. If they can get the popular perspective that Israel shouldn't be there and to persecute Israel, then of course, well, there will be what, what they are after, which is to retain those lands for other people. Now, we don't look at this, we look at this from the scriptural perspective and say, isn't this interesting that God is saying that they have to be there on that land, but also that this would lead to conflict. It's ultimately going to lead to Ezekiel 38. Remember I said there was evidence in Scripture that the gathering of Israel back to their land is one of the things that would lead to the nations being gathered against her. And there's just one of the little things that could lead in that sort of direction. And there's also, of course, the language of the mouth that speaks with great things. 
Okay, we have it in Daniel and in Revelation. And it's described in Revelation 16, as we discussed it, as the false prophet. So that mouth has certain words to say about that land. Just consider them. In 2014, we read, the time has come to forge a peace which rests on the acknowledgement by all of the right of two states to exist and to live in peace and security within internationally recognised borders. I mean, it sounds all very sensible and fine and equal, doesn't it? Peace must resolutely be pursued even if each side has to make certain sacrifices. It's actually the spirit that underlies our modern age that might very well be to do with those three frog-like spirits that we just read of in Revelation 16, but I won't go into that in any more detail. Just look, though, at the effect of this way of thinking. I express my appreciation for the efforts being made to draft an agreement with particular attention to religious freedom. Well, that's really liberty. Respect for this fundamental human right, that's equality, is in fact one of the essential conditions for peace fraternity and harmony the brotherhood of man these are the ideas which underpin our modern world they come out of the french revolution and they are there in revelation 16 it is possible to find a means of peaceful coexistence accepting our differences we're all brothers and sisters now of course to come to the point on the flight home then a little more was said about this the holy places of which, of course, that church has an interest, doesn't it? Has has an actual land that it owns in those places. The holy places must be perpetually maintained and protection given not only to the legacy of the past, but to those who want to come in the future. So we care about those, but look at this. Jerusalem will be the city of peace of the three religions. I would be in agreement if from negotiations there might come forward this part, it will be the capital of one state of another, and there is everything to be negotiated, all the territory, also the relations. So as far as that mouth is concerned, it could be divided any way. There is no scriptural definition that we need to take into account. The fact that Ezekiel 38 says they had to be there is irrelevant. The right of two states to exist, each side has to make certain sacrifices. But God says, my land, my people. Do you begin to see how, on the one hand, we have the nations of the world saying they shouldn't be in that place. And a religious element saying, well, you can carve it up how you like as long as we have the holy places in possession. And there's even that that very phrase... The holy places in possession is even a scriptural phrase. So that's beginning to set the scene too. And we can expect then that trend to continue too. And then if we look back at our map and think about, well, what about this large area over here that scripturally is defined as the dragon or Gog? Okay, it's Russia and her allies, isn't it? And look how they're described in Ezekiel 38. I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armour, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. You see, there was a big conflict a few years ago, a couple of years ago, when Ukraine decided, was it going to go towards the east or the west? Was it going to join the EU or the EEU. There's more strange initials. We've heard of the EU. Whatever is the EEU? Well, the answer is it's the Eurasian Economic Union. And that's something that Mr. Putin has been very patiently and carefully developing. In fact, it started before him. It started in the 1990s. And it covers already a vast tract of land. This is, this is an opposing system to the EU. It's another system, it's it's another grouping of nations, which they proudly tell us is of 173 million people and over 15% of the world's firm land. And they have an EEC, which is a uh, a Eurasian Economic Commission. And so the gathering of those nations, Russia and those former Soviet states, extending further beyond as well, is what they're all after. 
and they have a system of government. I'm not expecting you to read all that, but you think of the EU and the European Commission and the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament, and, well, they've got their own sort of version of it. And the thing that ties them together, of course, is that they're all Russian-speaking. There is, as well as having history, of course, which goes back centuries, and anybody who forgets, and, and politicians who forget the history of Russia, find they come a cropper, because there is, they, they live by their history. So the members of the Eurasian Union, of course, have been joined recently by the disputed Crimean Peninsula, because it was necessary, wasn't it, for Russia to have access to that, as it was always stated, the warm waters of the Black Sea. The ability for Russia then to have a fleet that could get around and outside into the, into the outside world and pursue whatever purposes they wanted to. Interestingly enough, Putin has been developing it so that he's eyeing a single currency for that Eurasian Union, just the same as equivalent to the EU single currency. And as you see there, although it starts out on economic integration, this extends into the political and even security realms. They want to have a bureaucracy to manage the economic space that would by design translate into Russian domination. Isn't that remarkable, really? Um, that was one of the things that came out of WikiLeaks uh, a couple of years ago. And it's certainly the case when we see headlines, as we have done in the last couple of years, about Russia and its threats to Europe, and even those planes that have come and buzzed uh, some of the, the British planes and in the mainland. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Really, the growth of Russia. And there's been stories about Putin privately invading to ra uh, privately threatening to invade Poland and Romania. And whatever the truth of it, it's certainly a remarkable turnaround, given how Russia was only a few years ago. Bring into that picture the possibility of Israel's newfound wealth from its oil stores. And the world has begun to recognise that Israel could be a threat to Putin's wealth. One of the biggest global finds of the decade. And the discovery of huge resources looks set to put Israel well on the road towards energy independence and turn it into an exporter. And it is likely to provide an attractive target for enemies of the Jewish state, we read. Well, we remember that Russia itself is trying to grow into a big exporter of oil and gas and thereby to create great wealth. So there's two themes there, isn't there? The growth of Russia and her friends and also the development of Israel and her wealth as a conflict and a competitor to Russia. So that's already been seen. That's been trends that have been developing over the last few years that are beginning to put the pieces into the jigsaw that we'd expect from Ezekiel 38. They're not there yet, clearly, but they're building towards it. And then we come to Brexit. And we say, well, what does that do to this picture? How has that moved things on? Remember what Ezekiel 38 told us. The merchants of Tarshish shall say to thee, art thou come to take a spoil? And Tarshish has been for a long time, hasn't it, in our brotherhood associated with Britain and her allies. In actual fact, there's a booklet here, uh, it's one of many, isn't it, but th from the 1930s, I think, the Brother Islip Collier wrote. And the arguments which are in it are some of those which are still valid today. And if nothing else, it's perhaps worthy of thought as to what the evidence is in Scripture for what Tarshish would do and what the characteristics are that Tarshish needs to satisfy. Whatever your own perspective, it's worth at least following that up. But just think about the development then of the European Union over the last few years. It started out really in 1952 with the Iron, sorry, with the European Coal and Steel Community. And it was initially presented then as an economic development. And when you, the UK joined it in 1973, which means that it's as old as me, or I'm as old as it, then it began then as a common market at that point when the UK went into it. And that, of course, has been the basis of a lot of argument, hasn't it, over the last few months. What was it that Britain went into, and what has it now become? There was a referendum in 1975, about which we've also heard. Should Britain stay there? And alongside that, 
the first few fumblings towards peace in Israel, when, first of all in 1979, peace with Egypt, bearing in mind what we read of in Ezekiel chapter 38. I remember in 1992 when the Maastricht Treaty, which was all about the change from just being an economic union to being a European Union. It changed from being the economic community, sorry, to the European Union. That's, that treaty was what it was all about. And all the problems that the Prime Minister of the day, Mr Major, had to try to get that bill through the House. And then we come to 1997. There was actually a, a political party. I wonder if anyone remembers that. The referendum party was set up to try to bring about a referendum for Britain to leave. And only two years later, in actual fact... There was another campaign from the opposing wing in this country, which was the Britain in Europe uh, party was launched. Well, the, it was a launch. It wasn't a party. That was the whole point. It had representatives from all three main political parties there. <coughs> and at that point, it looked like we were about to join the Euro. And yet, as Ezekiel had said, Tarshish has to stand aside. And it looked like the most unlikely thing at that point, that Tarshish was to leave the Union. And then along comes Cameron, elected to lead the Conservative Party in 2006, and saying, we really must stop banging on about Europe. How ironic, given that ten years later, he's the very Prime Minister, the very last thing he wanted to do, which was to lead to the position where Tarshish came out of Europe. So whatever our view then, the world has recognised that this has been a seismic result for British politics. The world has recognised that. But some have gone even further. Here's, here's a man people hate, don't they? What happened last Thursday was a remarkable result. It was indeed a seismic result, not just for British politics, for European politics, but perhaps even for global politics. Now, is that, is that hyperbole? Is that going over the top? Is that making too much of it? Well, just consider about what some of... The, the requirements of the prophecy were and how our world now begins to look like it. There was a requirement for Tarshish to have an independent voice. That was always the argument for those brothers and sisters who looked for Britain to come out of Europe. They said Tarshish has to have an independent voice because the merchants of Tarshish shall say unto thee. Now it's true that they don't take any military action apparently in Ezekiel 38, but they have to have enough independence of voice to make a challenge. And it was always, it was always felt that Britain couldn't do that if she was totally, totally tied into a European Union, particularly one that had its own army. So there was Tarshish. There is also the concept of Tarshish having trade with Israel. Remember the merchants of Tarshish, that in those ancient days when the ships of Tarshish would go all over the lands. Uh, remember that Jonah was going to go on a ship to go to Tarshish. So these ships were going all around. And as I say, I'm not going into the evidence behind Tarshish and the connections there today. But just notice this, that even before the referendum, there was a keenness in government circles to develop trade between Britain and Israel. Because Israel is recognised, isn't it, as a remarkable economic miracle. We too want to be a start-up nation, says the UK Cabinet Minister Matthew Hancock, who is leading a British trade delegation to Israel. And in fact, the Prime Minister of Israel recognised that whilst the United Nations was very largely anti-Israel, it devotes 60% of its country resolutions, 60% not against Syria, not against Iran, not against North Korea or Libya, but against Israel, the Middle East, the one and only democracy. That's how he sees it. Well, he was able to say, well, the British government has been trying to keep a fair eye and not to discriminate against Israel and Israelis. And in fact, the Israelis were particularly sad when they saw Cameron going. But the Times of Israel, just in this last week, has made an interesting observation. It suggested the UK may feel the need to rebut any suggestion of diminished influence by taking more of a lead on the global stage. The UK has a very large foreign aid budget and the best armed forces in Europe. It has committed significant resources to the fight against ISIS and shares common strategic interests with Israel. 
None of that's connected to, to the EU membership. So it's very possible, they're suggesting, that continued trade and strategic interests can carry on. So there's another trend to just keep an eye out for. But another one in Ezekiel 13 is that Sheba and Didan and the merchants of Tarshish are involved together. Well, Sheba and Didan is down in this area. And another consequence is suggested of that development that we've seen in the last couple of weeks could be a deepening of UK relations with the Arab states and increased bilateral trade, particularly with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. So it may very well be that one of the consequences is in actual fact that trade and military links between Sheba and Didan and the Young Lions, do you like it, um, will actually grow further, the Young Lion Cubs. What then about the European beast system? Well, I found this photo quite interesting because there's quite a lot going on in it. First of all, you can see the big television screen. And if you watch the BBC News, you'll know that that's Laura Koonsberg, who's their political editor. So she's, this is on the 24th, the day after the referendum. She's talking all about uh, what's happened. Coming in through the door into the EU Parliament building is Martin Schultz, who's the president. And it's 11 minutes past eight in Brussels and 11 minutes past seven, of course, in the UK. And they have the news on because this is what they're going to debate. They've now got a problem in their hands. Their, their markets are in crisis. The euro is being affected. Well, now, there came a proposal from the French and German foreign ministers very hard on the heels of this. How were they going to respond to Britain leaving Europe? How could they stop others leaving? Or would they want to? Together with his French counterpart, the German foreign minister has announced the EU's transformation to become a political union. This is a proposition from the German finance minister, foreign minister, to become a political union and its resolute <coughs> militarisation for global military operations. They are calling for the EU's comprehensive military build-up to enable future military operations. The EU should become an independent and global actor. All forces must be mobilised so that there is an integrated EU foreign and military policy. So the first response, and we'll have to see where this goes, is that in fact they see, well look, there should be a core of nations here who develop their ties even more closely. And that in actual fact they should develop a global military <coughs> operation. So on the one hand, you have the Eurasian Union with Mr. Putin and his friends building up a common security policy and being integrated. And on the other hand, you have Europe, which looks like it may be coming together and developing its own military policy. And this article, as you see, called the, they call it the European War Union. The foreign minister declared that Germany has become a major power and will try its best on the world stage to hold as much ground as possible. With Britain, which had always adamantly opposed an integrated EU military policy, leaving the EU, Berlin sees an opportunity for reviving its efforts at restructuring the EU's military, ready for the EU's future wars. So Britain having left, this article is suggesting, on the basis of what the German foreign minister is saying, is, well, look, they can now go ahead themselves and do that which Britain was always very, very reticent about. So if you take that European B system, well, you'd expect to see, sorry, you'd expect to see closer core integration. Perhaps, some have suggested, perhaps some of the nations around the edge might drop off. Perhaps some of those who are not so core to the original foundation of Europe will drop off and the picture will begin to assume that which you might expect. Perhaps there will be fewer nations. Whether that ten is literal or not, we'll have to see. But certainly the idea of common security is interesting. And what about Russia? Well, we've already referred to this in a sense. Five times in actual fact in Ezekiel 38, it says the many people who are with thee. And significantly, 
one of the first things that Putin did, whether it was, I suppose it had to have been planned before the referendum because it was almost the next day, Putin announced that the Russia-led Eurasian Economic Union can become part of a larger integration entity, a greater Eurasia, to include China, India, Pakistan, Iran, and the former Soviet states in the region. So we're not just talking now about Russia. We're not even just talking about the Soviet Union countries. We're bringing in China now. And we all know that that certainly has been a major superpower. Business will include, and then he went, he went, actually went to, to China. Business will include clinching a 6.2 billion high-speed rail deal, increased supply of Russian wheat. Everything connected to the Russia-China partnership spells out Eurasia integration. So you've got these massive blocks of power. They are building up and they are coming together. And as Britain has left the picture, it's opening a window. The, the Washington Post put it very nicely like this. In parallel to European fissures, European is breaking apart. Putin is consolidating strength. He's restored autocratic rule at home. He's crushed all serious dissent and mobilising popular support through foreign war. He stopped NATO's expansion by invading Georgia in 2008 and he slowed EU expansion by invading the Ukraine in 2014. He's increased Russia's economic hegemony, which isn't the word we use every day. It, it means there the, the political, economic and military control of other nations. Okay, so, so Putin gets to control other nations in other large parts of the former Soviet Union by building up this e EU and that he's even there in the Middle East as well. So some of the effects of Britain withdrawing from the Union are, are wider than we might at first think. Clearly Britain has an independent voice, although quite how that's going to pan out between now and the coming of Christ, we will wait to see. But equally the other players in that picture in Ezekiel 38 begin to take their positions Now, if you think about it, when the Lord goes forth, there is a picture that we're presented with. And it's consistent across all of these passages, which I'm not turning up, you'll be glad to know. In Ezekiel 38, you have a consistent picture that, in fact, Joel 3 reflects, and Zechariah 14, and Daniel in part 2. You have Israel back in the land. The nations gathered, the confederacy led, God intervening, the earthquake, soldiers fighting each other, God pleading or judging with the nations, as we've already thought. God using natural phenomena to disperse the foreign army. And ultimately, Israel delivered. There will come a time of trouble such as never was. We know that, don't we, from the, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the question is, my brothers and sisters, when the Lord comes and when he does all those things, we know the story. And I don't intend, in fact, to, to go into it in any more detail than that. But the question is, where are we in all of this? We know there is to be a time of trouble, of distress. And you have it, whether in Daniel or whether in Luke, it's the same picture. A, 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 a contracting in, a holding in. Brother Robert spoke of a time of distress of nations, which may be designated the natural stage. But you know, you can also find that we've seen some signs of what it might be like when banks fail, when the whole social fabric starts to break apart. You can consider that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the second stage, then, he says, that's when there are sweeping judgments of the Lord. And where are we during this whole sequence? I think Luke 21 gives us a useful hint when these things begin to come to pass. That's what we've got to be looking for, isn't it? When these things begin to come to pass then your redemption draweth nigh. He says in Luke 21, you don't have to see the end of them. And there's a very important reason why that's the case. You see, on more than one occasion, we have the idea of the goodman of the house, if he'd known what hour the thief would come, 
he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. And that's the very same language that we read in Revelation chapter 16. Jesus is coming as a thief. The world isn't recognising him. And we've got to be on our guard and watching, says the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the thing is this. We've talked about the gathering of the nations and the gathering of Israel. But there's also the gathering of the saints. If you think of it in the context of what we saw in Revelation 16, it's actually the the two parts of that process. And in the middle, says verse 15, he's coming to us. He's coming as a thief. Blessed is he that watches, lest he be found naked, it says. So there is a process whereby he comes to the household. And there are events before and events after but he must come to the household before he comes to the world. Just think of that principle. We must all appear before the judgment seat and judgment must begin, says the apostle, at the house of God. And the reason for that is is very simply expanded for us in Revelation 19 because here's the end of that picture that Revelation 16 started. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together. To make war against him that sat on the horse. That's the Lord Jesus in the picture. And against his army. So there's an army against Christ and there's an army with him. And if you look in the chapter, they've already been judged, this army. They're clothed in white raiment with him. So, when the world says peace and safety... I wonder if that's when the Lord comes. At the very point when everything seems to have gone quiet, and if that does happen, if it happens as we've suggested, then perhaps even we'll be surprised. Then perhaps that's when the Lord comes to us. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. You see, there is... There is a connection back to two previous letters that the Lord Jesus has written. He picks up the the picture from Sardis, which was they who had a name as living but not dead. That's why they were told to be watchful. And because he would come as a thief, that's what he told them in Revelation 3. And of Laodicea, who were neither cold nor hot, and had to be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So the Lord, and and let's not mistake this, the Lord could come tonight, I'm not saying he couldn't at all, and we we should be aware of that. But just perhaps there is a point in that sequence where the world is thinking they've solved the problem, and maybe we might be lulled into a false sense of security. And then he comes. And when he comes, brothers and sisters, when he comes in judgment, he is not looking for perfect people, is he? There are no perfect people. He's looking for people who have recognised our waywardness and our need for his forgiveness. He is looking for people who've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. He set forth his Son as a means of salvation, not of condemnation, for those who are in him. The things of which we've spoken and which, which herald the coming of the Lord are all about his coming to his household and he wants his household to be with him he's looking for his bride he has set the standard of forgiveness in how we treat each other so let us think carefully as we think about judgment the question is what is most important to me in my life and how day by day do the things of which we've been speaking relate to me that we're not just observing them as things that are going on out there. This is the evidence of the greatest event that has ever happened in our world when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and he calls you and I to himself. And when the master comes and calls for us and there is that knock on the door that we will be ready to go to him. Oh, we don't know how it will be, whether it will be an angel or whether it will be a brother or sister that we've known who's fallen asleep. But I'm quite sure there will be no doubt about it. 
and that we will be summoned to appear before him. None of us, nobody, brothers and sisters, could rock up before the Lord and say, I demand eternal life, I've earned it, could we? We stand in his righteousness, he who will be our righteousness. And yet our own lives need to reflect the greatness of the love that has been shown to us. We need to show by what is important to us, by how we live. And the Lord is merciful and forgiving to us, day by day now, and he will be then, if we've sought him in truth. You see, here's the other picture. Before I close, and I will, I promise soon, Song of Solomon, chapter 2. You just notice, this is the, the picture that he holds out for us. This might not be how we see ourselves, but this is how he sees us. And the song has a beautiful picture as it talks about the bride of Christ. And it has this double aspect, doesn't it, of the nation of Israel in, on one hand in the Old Testament and also his bride of Christ. And in ultimately, of course, the faithful of all ages are brought together in that bride, aren't they? Be they Jew or Gentile. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. And the rose of Sharon is not perhaps a rose as you and I think of as a rose, it's more like a tulip. In actual fact, that's what it's called, the Sharon tulip, that grows abundantly in the Sharon plain in the spring. This is the bride speaking. This is how the bride speaks of herself. A little low-growing plant, in actual fact. And she is the lily of the valleys. And it's not so much the lily... It's not the lily of the valley, the flower which you think of by that name. It does appear to be the lily as we know the lily, which has this trumpet shape and is white. In fact, the palace at Shushan or in Susa seems to have actually been called that because of the great number of lilies around it. And lilies appear throughout scripture in the temple. There they are on the top of the pillars and all around the, bar, the cup of the laver. So you have on the one hand the description that she sees herself as a red lily and on the other the whiteness of the lily. In fact, in the song there are numerous references to both the bride and the groom as the lily. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, if we take the figure, and the bride are pictured as lilies. And we know very well that lilies are there in the teaching of the Lord Jesus. How that they toil not, neither do they spin. Now, here's the point. The whiteness of that lily contrasts with something else, doesn't it? It contrasts with the tulip. Revelation 19 tells us to, that to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now, there's the whiteness of a lily. And it's almost as though, if we're not mixing the metaphor, that we start out, don't we, as tulips, as roses. But God is going to work with us to forgive us our sin, to make us white, because we've washed our robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now this isn't a call, is it, brothers and sisters, that we may continue in sin, that grace may abound, but rather that rejoicing in the forgiveness that God has given us, we might walk in him day by day. That's the picture that he gives us. And he has this beautiful picture in mind for us. The voice of my beloved. He's coming. He's on the way in this picture. The voice is the sound or the noise of his approach. And you can see the signs of him coming. That's what we've been thinking about today. Of his approach. He stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows. He's gazing through the lattice. There's, there's a picture of him in the song. As this stag, this young heart who's there. And you just notice in verse 10, my beloved spake, and he said, it's in the past tense. Why is it in the past tense when it's talking about an event that is yet to happen? Well, scripture often does this, doesn't it? But here's the point. The revised version actually puts it into the present tense and says, my beloved speaks and says to me. And what does he say? Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. 
He's already spoken to us. He's already told us when these things begin to come to pass, he's at the door. And what does he say? That's what he says. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. That when he appears, when he calls us to stand before him, that's how he wants to think of us. We want to think of him as the loving bridegroom. It's not that we don't stand to answer, as Paul says in in his letter, for what we've done in our lives. Of course, there is that side of it. But he's looking for us to be there as his children. And he desires us to be looking for him with all our failings and our sins. But he's able to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He's powerful to do it. And he's longing for us to be looking for him with that sort of intensity. The challenge for us every day of our lives as we live our lives is that we forget it, don't we? And there's all the mundane things of the everyday and the world goes on and it gives us its bad news and it doesn't understand. And the Lord says, I'm coming and I'm going to call you to myself for the low, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. And it's almost as though the winter season is out the way in this springtime picture that he's now going to develop. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come. And it's true in the nation of Israel, in the land, that spring is the time when the turtle dove sings. And yet, those words are in italics. So it may be that the singing is not the singing of birds, but as you see there, a song, a hymn of praise, a triumphal song. It may not be birds who are singing, but people The redeemed shall walk there. There are several links with Isaiah 35. I I won't go there now. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Oh yes, there is an application to Israel natural here too. But it's also true, isn't it, of those saints who were brought to the Lord God through the Lord Jesus. And he calls us to come to himself. And he notes, doesn't he, the development of the fig tree and all the trees, the green figs and the vines with tender grape giving a good smell. The time where the nation of Israel arises, when the nations begin to fit the picture that Ezekiel 38 gave us, and when he calls us to himself. So, brothers and sisters, when Messiah is enthroned, king of the land, and proceeds to take possession of its uttermost limits, he will then say to his companions, Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shinir and Hermon, from the, len- from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. This is what the bridegroom says to the bride. This is the words of the Lord Jesus, perhaps to his bride from all nations and all generations, brought to be with him, married to him, never to be separated from him, with all those we have loved in the truth of the Lord Jesus through so many ages, those we have known and those we have not, gathered together to be with him. This is the greatest thing the Lord could put before us. Taking up their position upon that commanding border, the sons of Zion may view the landscape of a goodly and glorious land. The Lord Jesus wants us to be with him in that day, to be joined to him. And he's calling to us every day, before the actual call comes. He says, arise, my fair one, my love, and come away. Leave behind that which dominates your thinking so often, our thinking and come to be with me.